What's going on, guys? James Camacho here. This is Kicking It With yeah, Camacho. Woo! That was a struggle, man. Ooh, I did. I did a bit of a. I did some calf raises today. Maybe, maybe that's why. You know, maybe I'm just get getting old. You know, how come every old person is always like, man, like my knees are acting up, my hips are acting up. You know, it's interesting because people don't really work out that part of their body. You know. Usually it's like chest or arms or like uh, squats. No one's ever like, yeah, man, I'm getting those, I'm getting those knees going. You know, maybe we should. Do, what could be a good knee exercise? I guess like um, jogging, right? Don't they say jogging's like, like uh, bad for your knees? But it's bad because if you jog too much, it's because I don't know. But you know who's got the best calves is uh, people who are just fat. You ever realize that? You ever see like a, like a chunky just whoop person and but like their calves are are huge. It's like I I I do like calf raises and like you know all this stuff, but like my calves don't really like I can't I could never get a fat person's calves because I'm not like holding up like 822 pounds. I'm only holding up like 160 pounds, you know. So I'm never gonna I'm never gonna get those. Um, God, what do they call them? What's like what's like slang for nice calves? Oh, tree trunks. I'm not going to ever get those uh, tree trunks, you know, because, um, yeah, man, does that right in if you're fat, do you feel like your uh, your calves are always sore <laughs> from hold, holding you up? You know, man, the body is an amazing thing. Anyways, guys, hope you had a great weekend. Um, you know, speaking of the gym, I, I got out of the gym not too long ago. That's why I got a tank top on. It's also uh, what is it? 70 degrees. It's like the first 70 degree day of the year. It is hot. Um, I got to put in the AC when I'm not late. It's literally the AC is sitting right there. All I have to do is pick it up, shimmy it in the windowsill, and then close the, the window on top of it and then plug it in. But uh, I don't know. I grew up, you know, I grew up very uh, cheap, you know, like with the AC. It's like if I was home, unless my dad was home, the AC had to be like off pretty much because like my, my mom – you know, wanted to like save money on the electric bill. So it was like, if my dad was home, my dad wanted AC on like literally all the time. But I guess if when he left, it's just like, well, you know, I don't give a fuck if my son is, uh, is, is staying cool. So let's, let's crank it back on. And then like, I don't know what it is. Some, I feel like Asian, like, especially like immigrant Chinese people have a really good tolerance for heat, you know? Cause like every time I visit my, um, my aunt in LA, I mean, bro, like, she wanted any AC on. And she's got, like, a big house. She, like, lives in a mansion. But legitimately, like, like her, the house is, like, you know, because L.A. is hot, right? It literally gets, like, 80 degrees during the day. And, like, the house is just, like, a sauna, man. And uh, she's totally cool, man. She'll wear, like, uh, long sleeves, like, like long, you know, sweatpants. She'll have, like, a parka on, you know, just having a great time, you know? I guess you could just get used to it. I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm like my my base level is just being a, a pussy if you think about it. Because like I just like I take like normal warm showers, you know, I uh, I like 60 degree weather. Like there's no like I'm not an extreme in any way possible, any way, shape or form, you know. But um, sorry, guys, I think I have a I think I have like a an eyelash that's like bigger than the others. You ever have that? You ever just like, you know, check yourself out, you know, be like, hey, man. What's this fine piece of ass doing over there? Right here, you look in the mirror and then you just find like one eyelash is like just, you know, just cracked out. It's like, yeah, that happens to me sometimes. I'll have like an eyelash that's like longer than the others. I'm just like, you know, I stare at myself every day, you know. I'm not like conceited, but it's like, you know, I, I you know, before I go out, I want to make sure I don't have any jizz on my face, you know, I don't have any weird things going on, you know. It's like, when did you get that big? Like, did you literally just grow? Like uh, like um, a magic stock, right? Overnight, like how could you, how could I have not caught that? You know what I mean? Anyways, hope you guys had a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed the Saturday episode of the the podcast. Uh, viewership's a little down. I don't know what's going on out there. I don't know if you guys hate me. It's weird. The viewership is going down, but the average watch time is going down. So I guess the hardcore guys, our girls, or they them's are uh, are tuning in. And then, like, the, I guess the casual customers are, uh, like, you know, we were sick of this guy talking. You know, he's not interesting. So, I appreciate the listeners. Um, let's give you an update on my goals. 
Currently at 2,986 watch hours of 3,000. We are 14 hours away, guys. Um, so we should probably get to that uh, in the next couple days. Um, bench goal. Um, the max is still 215. Um, I did bench today, 165 for eight. And um, I'm going to work my way up to 185 for eight. And then after I do that, I'm going to do a strength training day where I try to do 225 for one repetition. Sorry, is this, is this is this fucking up the podcast because I keep messing with my eyelashes? I got to stop cursing, by the way. Um, yeah, I feel like YouTube. I mean, I'm not even monetized, but like I'm trying to be careful. You know, I have this real fear that like I get my monetization uh, requirements. And then they reject me because I curse too much. That's what happened with my Facebook, dude. Like, my Facebook was popping for a little bit. And then um, I, I I literally qualified for all the watch out. Like, I qualified for monetization. Like, I had the watch hours. I had the subscribers, followers, whatever. And then they just randomly were like, you know, we can't accept into the program because you go against our, mon like, like, community guidelines policy. I'm just like, what the hell is that? Like... And then, like, I looked, like, to see if I had any, like, strikes or videos that were, like, again, and they, there was none. But, like, I know I curse a lot in some of my, like, the podcast videos, and uh, I I don't know. It's just, it just sucks, man. You know, I hate dealing with this, with this with this crap. It's so out of my control. I always say, guys, it's like, you know what causes depression is feelings of hopelessness. And, like, literally when you're dealing with this social media crap as a, as an artist, or you could, you could even be, like, trying to sell your... Um, some product and you're on like whatever social media trying to get some like videos going to it's just like dude it's all out of your control man it, it, it's really rough um speaking of that guys do me a favor um obviously you guys are awesome for watching this but please like share subscribe if you uh if you do get it on um apple podcast or spotify leave a nice review um do me a big favor if you don't already already go follow me on instagram at kamach bro and uh Please watch uh, some of my stand-up reels and uh, watch all the way to the end. Give it a like, comment, maybe share. Um, for some real weird reason, real wee reason? What am I, uh, um, Daffy Duck out here? Is it Daffy Duck that goes wee wee wee? I taught I taught put the cat. No, Elmer Fudd. Um, what am I, Elmer Fudd out here? Uh, for some weird reason, wee I Man, that's not even me trying to do a character. That's actually me, like, having a speech impediment. Hmm. It's weird. I have a speech impediment, but like when I'm on stage doing stand up, I don't have it. You know, I don't know. Um, please go do me a favor and go on my uh, Instagram page and like some of the stand up clips. Uh, for some real weird reason, it's because weird and reason. I'm saying that back and forth. Let me try saying that three times fast. Weird reason, weird reason, weird reason, weird reason, weird reason. Um, I did it, but it was definitely a. Feel my little, my you know, my lip muscles a little sore. Um, please go do me a favor, like some of the stand-up clips. For some uh, reason, they never do well. Um, I, I I guess, um, you know, and like I know the jokes are good. Like I, I'm literally taking bits I'm doing on stage that are killing, and uh, posting them, and um, they get no traction. And you know. I'm not blaming, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, be one of these guys, blame the algorithm, blame this, blame that. But it's like, I look at the analytics and it's clear that the people that follow me don't really, uh, either they, either they're like, I don't, I just don't think, I think most people aren't watching my stand up clip. Like we have, I have some people that are watching the whole thing. And I think some people don't like, like literally, don't give a shit that I do stand up. Maybe they don't know I do stand up. Maybe they think I'm some like a uh, hobbyist or something. So they're like, oh, this guy's like, what, this guy's at an open mic and he's, who, I, what the fuck? Because like all the stuff that does well on my uh, Instagram and social media is me like doing front facing videos. So I just maybe think that people, you know, they follow me for the that and they like that. And then once they see me do a stand up thing, they're like, what the, f I don't give a shit, you know? So. But which is a bummer because stand up is the really the only thing I care about. It's like literally my passion in life, and the fact that like uh, you know I'm doing this and I, I, I'm putting out content, I'm putting myself out there, and uh, literally just just getting um, um, like out of ten, like a one of the reception response that I feel like I deserve 
it's uh it's kind of soul crushing it's kind of tough and the only way it's going to change is if, if people watch the video all the way through obviously i can't make people do that um and i can't make people ca stand up do really people really don't give a shit about like stand up you know like i feel like if i was like posting content of me like in a movie or like uh i don't want to complain about this anymore anyways guys just help me out go like the stuff i love stand up i love being a comedian I hate this part of the business where I have to post content and put myself out there and fail uh, pretty much every day. I really appreciate it. Speaking of stand-up, um, I'm going to be having a great time on these live shows because that's what it's all about. Bahamas, April 22nd to May 5th. Kenosha Comedy Club, May 17th to 18th. McKinney, Texas, May 31st to June 1st. Gilbert, Arizona, June 7th to 8th. Um, Home Duck Casino, June 10th. Stress Factory Comedy Club, June 29th. Um, I'm going to be filming uh, those shows for stand-up clips that will probably uh, bomb on social media. Uh, man, uh, if you if you guys can, no one comments ever, so I'm basically, this is just like me being, a, this is basically me just talking to myself. Um, I wonder what you guys think, like, I wonder if anyone is actually like, okay, yeah, maybe I will comment, or I'm literally just talking. Sometimes I really feel like no one's watching this. It's kind of sad, but, you know, you got to be delusional to be in this business um what was i what was i gonna say oh if you if you uh li literally you could just comment be like i don't give a shit about your stand-up clips um let me know so i could stop doing them because they take so much time to uh make and um i literally get no reward from it like all i do is like put myself out there for like and just uh for it to go to nobody and it's uh i don't know why i'm gonna keep uh, hurting myself by doing it so let me know um, so I can like save time in the future. Um, also, let's give a shout out to the New York Knicks. Obviously, I'm in New York. Get, get, dude, number two seed, man. That was a gutsy. You know, I think they're like, um, what are they, 19 and three with OG and Anobi um, in the lineup. I mean, you know, there was all this doubt, you know, with Randall out. And then like, you know, Mitchell Robinson was out for a while. Like, maybe, you know, like, they had these, like, really big expectations in the beginning of the year, like, maybe conference finals type of stuff. But then now, you know, people were like, once the injuries are piling up, people were like, ah, uh, you know, like, maybe, um, you know, with Randall out, you know, if they if they win a one round of the playoffs, they'll be fine. It's like, I don't know, bro. They got OG back. They're literally 19-3 and three with him in the lineup. They're the second seed. I mean, if if, you know... It's weird to be like, oh, the second seed doesn't have much expectations, right? Like, people keep... It's it's just interesting. It's like, I obviously get what people are saying with, like, you know, the injuries. And then, obviously, it's like, you have, like, the like these teams like the Miami Heat who always turn up in the playoffs. You have uh, the 76ers who literally are like... Uh, they're like, um, they just got their best player back. But still, those teams are, like, seven, eight seeds. And... The Knicks are the second seed. Like, let's not forget about that, you know? Like, we give Boston all this praise. Oh, they're number one seed. Like, they're going to just, they're a shoe in. Like, they're the favorites. It's like, yeah, if you're number two, you should be kind of second favorite if you, if you really think about it. Like, obviously, I know playoffs are different, uh, uh, especially in basketball. People really actually try in the playoffs. But still, it's like, I will say if the Knicks don't, uh, man, definitely want to win a first round. Um... God damn, how many rounds are there in the playoffs? Three to the finals? Yeah, man, I would say being a number two seed, if they don't get to the Eastern Conference Finals, I guess I could also accept them losing maybe like a seven-game series in the second round. But if they get blown out in the second round or if they don't even make it to the second round, that's going to be a huge bummer, man. But shout-out to the Knicks. Shout-out to Jalen Brunson, man. Like This is honestly the first time in my life um, that it's been exciting to watch the Knicks, man. It's been really abysmal for such a long time. So this has been really cool, man. And um, it's uh, been filling up my uh, my football void, as you guys know, football season. It's like I, I'm all, I, like I basically dedicate my whole Sundays to that. And uh, my Mariners, my baseball team. Um, I mean, they've been they're they're just like the Knicks. They've been bad for so long, and this year they they really are. I think they're in last place right now, maybe tied for last place or close to last place. I mean, the Oakland Athletics, who aren't even trying to win games, 
is has a better record than my Mariners. So shout out to the Knicks for being great. Shout out to them for like giving me something to look forward to in sports. Um, but yeah, let's get into the podcast, guys. Um, I had a really fun weekend of uh, shows in New York City. Um, like, I, I, man, I got like you know, I was really, I was, I was really, uh, I was really getting down earlier about the stand up and social media stuff, you know. But it's like, man, like doing live shows, like thank God for that, man. Like, like, like I say, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll do the show and like, I don't know, I just have this thing of like. I know, like, when I do the shows, they go well, I have fun, you know, you know, I feel like a fucking uh, rock star, you know, I'm like, I'm so funny, I work so hard, I, I got to where I am because I put in the work, I've been doing this for 10 years, like, all this stuff, you know, and then I, I'll, I'll like, uh, I'll be so proud of a joke that I can get to work, right, and then I clip it and I put it online and, like, whatever, man, it's just, like, it it doesn't resonate with people that follow me or it doesn't resonate with people. I don't know what about me um, and my stand-up doesn't translate to success on the internet, but doing the shows is the best thing, man. I will trade, like, listen, I, I, would, I would literally trade all of my content online, getting zero views um, for the rest of my life. Um, for just consistent stage time for the rest of my life, a hundred percent, man. Because there, I mean, there's just nothing better than than being on stage in front of a live crowd and making people laugh. And I'm I'm fucking good at it. And I don't understand why online it it do, people don't care. I don't understand why people don't care online. Maybe I'm not famous. I uh, maybe I gotta maybe I gotta get bigger tits. You know, I, I maybe I gotta wear tighter shirts. Uh, uh, something. Maybe I gotta cut my hair. Maybe people see me. It's like, oh, that guy's. Uh, his hair is unkempt. Uh, he's got a skateboard shirt on. You know, this guy's a piece of shit. You know, there is something to that. That's why Matt Reif got pretty big, you know? Not to say he's not talented, but, like, the guy is just a gorgeous. He's just a specimen, you know? But anyway, so I had some great shows, man. And I got to say, man, like, I am always at my happiest when I am consistently working and doing shows. So this weekend, I had, in New York City, man, the greatest city in the world, I had four, four different, I had how many shows? Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven shows in four different comedy clubs. No, I think five. Five different. Co- <laughs> I don't know anything. Um, I had seven shows. I think five different comedy clubs from Thursday through uh, Sunday. Man, I mean, you know, as down as I can get on myself, and as like, because uh, I'm ambitious, right? When I get down, it's not like you know, I I feel like nothing's happening. It's just like I I I I. It's because I want. Uh, success, you know, um, and I expect more of myself. So, um, but yeah, man, when I really sit down and like spell it out in my head, it's like, dude, um, I am consistently getting stage time. I'm getting paid to do comedy in New York City on a consistent like that is so amazing, man. And to be able to do like four, f- four different, cl- five different clubs. On a on a weekend in New York, like man, most people would uh, most people would dream that. So I am so fortunate, man. And we started off the weekend with doing a uh, Rodney's Comedy Club, which is um, it's a new club, kind of. So there used to be this club called Dangerfields, obviously named after Rodney Dangerfield. Um, it had been in New York for uh, man, for like 30, 40 years or something like that, and they closed during the pandemic. Um, and then they reopened new ownership and they called it Rodney. So they just switched first. They switched last name to first name. Um, and it was my first time performing there, which is kind of bittersweet because I was passed at the old danger fields. Like I was a regular there. I used to perform there on weekends. Um, it was, uh, it was where uh, it was actually where my, ex, I took my ex-girlfriend out, um, to our first date. She saw me do a show there, and uh, I did. You know, I did pretty well. You know, so you know, locked down a four-year relationship after that set. But um, yeah, and uh, you know, obviously with new regime changes, new ownership, uh, you know, the talent changes. So I'm I'm out now. But I was able to hop on a show there Thursday, um, and man, it is uh, it is it is uh, this is how like sad and negative comedians are. So literally, it's like a weekday. I think it was raining that day. 
Thursday, right? I'm just like, ah, you know, there'll be like 20 people there, 25 people there. You know, I'll have a, you know, I'll do my best stuff because I've never, I know, I, I may, I'm trying to impress whoever's, uh, you know, working there now. Maybe I can uh, get into the rotation, uh, you know, but it's going to be a probably a chill, low stakes night. And dude, I show up to Rodney's, right? I live 20 blocks away from Rodney. So I like, I, I, I get my steps in, you know, um, it's one of these days where it's like half raining, half not. So I got the umbrella up, right? And then like it stops raining, right? And then I get in my head like, wait. I have my umbrella out when it's not raining. Like, are people going to think I'm soft? So I put it away. But then it starts raining again. I put it out, right? And then I finally get there. And do I walk in? And it's beautiful, right? So the old club was kind of like, it kind of looked like a haunted house a little bit, you know? Like, you ever remember when you were a kid and uh, before cell phones and before the internet, you would run around and then you stumble upon a house that was abandoned. And then you go in there. Like, that's kind of what Danger Fields felt like, the old one doesn't really put it in a great light but uh it was very dark you know a lot of candles maybe that's how they were trying to save money by not paying an electric bill by using candles anyways but it was like it was like pitch black in there and um just old man like like um you know like literally just old school new york city you know like you got like i don't know dirty carpet just just black walls and uh yeah, just just you know, really dimly lit. Um, but still, like there's a, I, there's a, there's definitely a charm to that. That uh, I always liked performing at Dangerfields. A um, lot a lot a lot of comedians kind of made fun of it, but I always thought it was great. Um, so I go in there, and then um, I go in, and dude, it's like completely different. Like it used to be black walls. Now it's like white and like you know blue. The bar used to just be this, this this wooden bar that was like stained up, like sticky. It's just this nice slick marble bar. Um, and then like I go in, like the first people I see are like uh, the staff are like people that that used to work at a New York comedy club. And I'm like, oh my god! It's like I know everyone here, you know. And like that's that's just another thing where it's like I'm so antisocial. You know, I always talk about how like I don't network and communicate great. Like I'm really struggling with that. It's like. Every time I go out, like, uh, I always see people I know, and I always feel great, you know? So, like, I go into this place, I'm like, I know you, I know you, I know you. Like, I, my whole fear is, like, I'm going to go somewhere, and I'm not going to know anybody. But, like, literally every time I go somewhere, I know everybody, you know? God, I wish I had more self-esteem. But I, uh, I go in there, I see all these people I know, say hi, yada, yada, yada. And then I go, let's, you know, let's, let's walk around the club. Let's see uh, how it's changed, how it looks different. Um, so I go downstairs, that's where the bathroom is, um, it's also where Rodney's, um, old green room used to be, which apparently is haunted, um, which I never experienced any hauntedness there, but, like, I used to just sit in that green room, and, like, it was very weird, because, like, you literally, you're literally in Rodney Dangerfield's, like, dressing room, um, so, like, yeah, I don't know if it's in my head, but it definitely felt like there was some aura in there like you you weren't exactly uh alone i guess you know but it's probably that's probably just in my head you know like if i had no idea it was rodney dangerfield's green room and i went in there and sat down i probably wouldn't have thought any different you know what i mean i don't know if that's true though because sometimes you could just sometimes you can feel if a place is haunted or not you know like there was this road gig i was doing in orlando and i get into i check in the hotel man i just like had that it was just, just very, it was very, again, like old school, you know, like, uh, what is old school the right term when like a building has like a, like, I don't know, like very vintage, like 1960s build, right? High ceilings, uh, just a lot of wood and, uh, but still nice, but it's like, it's just the whole, the whole hotel was like, I don't know, like quiet and like, you know, not very populated. And then I'm like, man, this kind of this place, like, you know, in my head, I'm joking, like, yeah, it feels haunted in here. It's kind of like a haunted, uh, haunted hotel. And then um, I go uh, do the show later. I tell the, I tell the, the booker, like, the hotel feels haunted. And he goes, oh it, no, it is, it is haunted. I'm like, huh? And he's like, yeah, it's like one of the most haunted places, like, in in the in America. Like, it's like on every list, you know. Let me let me see if I can find it right now. I could I could let you guys know. Um, but yeah, it's like. I'm sure if I Google Orlando Haunted Hotel, it's going to be like the first thing that comes up. Let's see. Um, 
Let's see. The most haunted places in Orlando, Florida. The site of the Ted Bundy. Oh, Jesus. It's always hospitals and uh, hotels, I feel like. Um, let's see. Is this it? No, no, no. Uh, I'm going through a list right now. Ten through one. And I am not I am not seeing the place. Oh, fuck. Maybe it wasn't as haunted as I thought. Um oh you know what? It's not in Orlando, it's in St. Cloud. Sorry, it's in St. Cloud, Florida, which is like right by by there. Um Is this it Hunter Arms Hotel? I think this is it. Yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah, Hunter Arms Hotel. Um Vivian is the yep. This is it. Vivian is the name of the ghost that is rumored to haunt the hotel. Guests have claimed to hear strange sounds, feelings of coldness, doors slam on their own, and water faucets that turn on by themselves. Um, the interesting place about this is that they uh, filmed the the Water Boy in there with Adam Sandler. So that's pretty cool. But anyways, we got off topic there. So, um, Danger Fields, right? I'm walking around, you know, checking out the new digs, and then I'm, I go into the showroom, right, to see what they've done with the showroom. And uh, again, I think there's going to be 20 people in there. Walk in. Dude, it's sold out. There's like 100 something people in there, you know? And I'm just like immediately, I go from like, uh, yep, I'm going to, you know, I'll do this bit. I'll screw around with that thing. I'll try this thing out that I've been, this new idea. I'm like, ah! you know, I literally see the 100 people and immediately like all this stress starts coming in. I'm like, fuck, there's 100 people. Um, it's my first time here, and like some of the people that I saw, remember I was like, uh, oh, like I recognize that. Like there are people that that, that like booked the um, New York, old New York Comedy Club, so I'm like, oh my god, you know, it's like this isn't a show I can like, you know, this is in a weird way. It's like now I got to treat it like an audition, you know. Not to say I wasn't gonna treat it like an audition before, but there is, you know, there's a difference between like, oh, you're auditioning. It, it, it's 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 hard to say because like I think what most people think of audition. They think of like, oh, you go in front of like, like casting directors and stuff. Like, but imagine if like, you know, as a comedian, it's like if you're going to audition for someone and there's like 20 people in the crowd versus like 100 people when it's sold out. Right. Like that energy is very different. You know, like with 20 people, I just feel like it's more lax. And like, you know, there's this weird feeling of like, well, there's only 20 people. Like I'm going to do the best I can. But if there's 100 people, then there's like almost like there's like no excuse, you know, because like this is literally what the apex is like sold out how are you gonna do you're gonna kill you know there is i i yeah it's so yeah so now i'm just kind of like uh but i'm trying to it's weird because like there's really no pl it's like it's like not, i can't like hide you know like it's not like I, I can just go hide in a corner look over my act it's like i, I see all these people that i know so i have to constantly kind of like be social right and it was just so weird because like like i'm talking to this one comic you know she does like warm up for, uh, the view and I'm I'm, literally, I'm trying my best to like listen to what she's saying but I know in the back of my head like I'm just thinking about my set and like God, there's a hundred people here oh my god and uh I kind of it kind of felt like I was uh in my like my last relate like in my last relationship you know where you're like you're thinking about something and your girlfriend's trying to tell you a story and you're like uh-huh 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 and, like, obviously, like, this girl I was talking to, like, we're not dating, so she just probably was like, oh, this guy could give a shit, right? But then your girlfriend, you know, they're like, are you listening? You know, I can tell you're not listening. And you have to be like, I'm listening, I'm listening, but you're not. Um, you know, like, that's one of the things I feel like in my past relationship that I shouldn't have done. Like, I, I would always try to do too much. Like, I would be thinking about something, but then I would also try to be a good boyfriend, you know? Like, I'd be, like, worried about, I don't know, doing a show at night. But then I would try to, like, uh, you know, go out with her. And I, I couldn't be fully there because I was thinking about the show, you know. Anyways, we're, we're, this is, I am getting, I'm all over the place today, you know. I'm, like, I, I got, like, a, I got like a, a, an energy of, like, cocaine and a, and a, and a heroin right now. Because, like, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit downsy, but I'm also, like, sk uh, skittish, you know. Anyway, so, yeah, I get there's, like, 100 people, man. I'm like, oh my god, and uh, you know, I'm watching the comic. I'm watching the other comics go on, and like, they're doing okay. You know, like, like they're getting like, you know, pops here and there, applause here and there, um, but not doing like, not like well, well. You know, so I start to get a little nervous. I'm just like, man, this crowd stinks. Like, uh, 
I don't want my first impression um, to be bad, yada, yada, yada. Um, but, you know, like I tend to do, I don't give myself enough credit. I go on stage, have a 12-minute set. I rock it, man. I rock it. Literally, from the beginning all the way to the end, set was was fantastic. I end on a big applause break. And, um, yeah, just, just a great set, man. Um, I saw one of the bouncers for the club later that week, and he was telling me, like, as the people were leaving that night, they were, uh, they were like, man, like, they were saying that I was one of their favorites, which is so nice. Um, so had a great set. Um, and it just goes to show you, man, it's like, especially as a comedian, you can never, uh, d d don't have such low expectations, you know, because this does happen a lot where I'm like, oh, it's whatever day of the week, it's going to be slow. Who gives a crap? And then, like, I don't know. Like, I just feel like uh, I can write. I, I, the way I write, the way I approach may not be the way I approach if I know something's going to be sold out, you know? And I, I guess it's, like, it's tough because, like, I do stand-up every night. So, obviously, it's, like, you know, there's going to be nights where you want to kind of, like, you know, just, like, give a little less effort, like, reserve yourself, you know? But, yeah, I mean, it goes with, I guess it goes with anything in life that you care about. Um, you just gotta, um, you know, whether it's, I don't know, you're doing a pickup game of basketball, just, you gotta give it all your, give it your all. Not to say I, I wasn't planning on giving it my all. It was just like my mindset going into the night was like, oh, this is not good. You know, this is not going to be, uh, that big of a deal, but it ended up being a big deal. I did really well. And, um, you know, I don't know if anyone saw it. That's another one. That's another thing in a, a stand up that a lot of comedians, I don't know if com any comedians are watching this, but it's like, I mean, how many times do we do shows? We kill, and then we think everyone loves us, and then we're the funniest people in the world, and um, not a single thing happens from it, right? You may get a couple, oh, that was funnies, but you know, not a single industry acknowledges you, not a single booker was watching. So it's like, it's almost like one of those things, like if a tree falls in a forest, was anyone around to hear it? But again, that's definitely not true. It's obviously like the most important thing is that people that were in the crowd had a good time and, uh, you know, you're just doing your job. But man, it is uh, it's it's a tough business. That, that's all I'll say, you know. Um, so, yeah, I had uh, uh, Rodney's on uh, Thursday. That was great. And then after that, I ran over. I did a late night at the comic strip, which was uh, humbling. I think I did it all new. The comic strip, late, I, late night for comic strip is for me to work on new stuff. So I did all this new material, ate shit, uh, walk back home, laugh it off. Next day, I go do the comedy shop um, at 8. And then, uh, no. Yes. No, no, no. I have comedy shop at 8. And then I go do Eastville. Uh, both great shows. Eastville was a lot of fun. I miss, you know, I'm at Eastville maybe like once a month, but, um, it's always a good vibe. Um, Eastville Comedy Club in Brooklyn, shout out to them. Um, I love their, I love that club because like they have people that are, um, they're like half Manhattan, half Brooklyn. Like they're not so like hipstery and woke and like, you know, um, progressive. Um, you still have this, like this kind of just, just, you know, regular comedy club, uh, five and uh yeah so that was fun and then on saturday i did uh the comedy shop again and then i went to three monkeys um had lunch with a friend that was see i'm look, look at me look at me being social i it, it is funny though because like i literally had the like i don't know if anyone else has this mindset but it's just like i'm like i gotta be social right because i gotta be i i, I don't know it's just for my own mental health right so, like, you know, and I texted some friend. I mean, I'm not forcing anything. Like, the guy I went out with was, like, my one of my best friends. So, um, and we had a really fun lunch, fun time. But it's, like, yeah, it just, it, it's so, it's tough. It doesn't come to me naturally to uh, make plans, go to lunch, you know. But, yeah, so we did that. And then Sunday, yesterday, I just did a spot at the comic strip. And then um, it was, it was, uh, it was, that crowd was actually kind of tough. Um I went on third, and I feel like the the host and the first two comics uh, were really pulling teeth. But I did crack them open a little bit. But it's just one of these things, man, where it's like, you know, um, you're just pulling. You're just trying so hard to get people to, like, 
give you something, you know? Like, I'm trying to think of a comp. It's just like, I don't know, it's like if you're in a relationship, right? Or if you're like, I don't know, you're trying to woo someone and they're just like indifferent towards you, right? So it's just like, or maybe like you're growing up, you're trying to fit in, but it's like anything you do, anything you say, it just feels like, it's just like they're not, they're not responding, you know? Um, and then you kind of like, there's this kind of sad feeling of like, um, why, 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 why do I still try? Why am I even still trying? You know, but as a comedian, it's just one of these things where it's like, you can always get a crowd because so you like, you know, if a crowd's tough with every joke you, you do that works and kind of, you know, gets them to laugh a little bit, it's just kind of building off that, you know, oh, 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 sorry. I, I thought I saw Trump's in town apparently. And I, I thought I saw like a. One of those um, escalades, and uh, I thought I thought I saw I thought I saw one of those uh, precisions where they escort the government officials. But yeah, so um, it was a tough crowd, but I, I was able to like uh, win them over for sure. And then like after I went on, the show got pretty good. And then I did get a DM from someone that was at the show that she was like, uh, "Sorry for the dead crowd yesterday, but you were great." So that was very nice. So all in all. A fantastic weekend. Um, a week. I'm just so grateful, man. That like, um, man, like it's really been a journey. I've been doing comedy for ten years, and like I'm at the point now where it's like literally, I consistently uh, just just get work. In the, in the it's just, I don't know. It's just so humbling, you know. Like even this weekend, um, all weekend I have shows. Like I'm 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 uh, in the city, you know, the greatest city in the world, doing comedy, and like yeah. I'm not playing the cellar yet. I'm not playing the stand. I'm like, I'm not like famous or anything, you know, but it's like um, just the fact that I can just do my, my art form and make money. Um, I know I'll get to the those big spots eventually, but I'm just trying to be very thankful, man, because it's so easy, especially with this stupid social media horse crap to get to just get down on yourself, you know, just 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 ugh. But anyways, um. So yeah, that was my kind of weekend of shows, guys. I hope uh, hope you had a great weekend. Uh, you know, just you know, I think most people uh, probably uh, you know screw around on the weekend. You know, they go to brunch, go to dinner, see a friend. Uh, for me, the things that I do on the weekends that get my rocks off are uh, just just performing. So I appreciate anyone that was at the shows that's watching this. Um, let's get into some some new stuff real quick, and then we got a motivational quote. Um. This one's interesting. So these aren't exactly like crazy, like trending news articles. I know there's a lot going on in the world, but um, I don't want to talk about things I'm not really knowledgeable about. Like I know we have um, Iran attacked. Um, uh, oh man, let me get this right. So Iran attacked. There was an uh, Iran attacked Israel. Um, we got this uh, rap be beef. We got uh, Drake. Uh, Rick Ross, all this stuff. Uh, uh, who else? The weekend. And um, listen, I don't know nothing. Like, I don't know nothing about politics. I also am not that dialed in into the rap world, so I'll acknowledge those things are happening. I don't want you guys to be like, does this guy, does this guy not know what pop culture is? Like, I do, but like, I don't really listen to like rap like that. I'm more of a rock and uh, like house house music guy. Um, so. I'm not going to speak on that. All I will say this is, is that, like, I would guess that these guys, obviously, like, they, they, I don't think this beef is that real. I think it's for a lot of publicity. It's the way to promote songs and get more listens, you know. I mean, it's smart, but also it's just kind of like, you know, it feels clickbaity to me where it's just like, obviously, you already have a built-in, like, built, you, have, you already have built-in, like, uh, uh, you have a built-in audience when, you, when these guys... Cause they're, cause you know, they're going to diss the other guy on the track, you know? And it's just like, can we get someone to make an original creative song? And listen, you could be creative dissing someone. I'm just saying, it's just like, I don't know. I just, I just, uh, it just feels clickbaity to me, you know? And like, I kind of appreciate more when people just make stuff to make stuff, um, I don't know. That's that's just me though. But I, I'm not a fan of that kind of stuff. I've never been a fan of like beef. I never really cared. Like you know, 
in comedy, there's a lot of these like roast battle things. Um, I've never been interested in that. I'm just a guy that's like, hey, I like the work on my act, and like that. That's it, you know. So, yeah. Um, I so I can't, you know. I, I, I'm obviously not gonna get into the the war stuff. I I listen. I I can know. I don't know nothing about that. You know, I don't want to spew opinions with absolutely no research. So let's uh, let's just get into some uh, some some fluffier stuff. Um, this is interesting. Remote workers brace for harsh reality check and are committing career suicide, study says. So uh, since the pandemic drove countless Americans to flee big coastal cities, there's been speculation as to whether they'd ever return. While residing in smaller towns offers affordability and a high quality of life, not to mention cheaper prices, many urban refugees yearn for cultural richness, richness and culinary delights left behind. Um, recently, hopes of a re reversed surf. Recently, hopes of a re reversal surface with the release of new Census Bureau estimates on domestic migration. However, numbers tell a different tale. Um, yeah, so basically this article is saying, like, obviously with COVID, um, you know, it, it and, and with, like, you know, inflation and stuff, it really drove people out of major cities, um, which is, you know, true. But this research says that um, this guy, Enrico Moretti, an economist at uh, Berkeley, he says that um, leaving major cities can cripple career prospects. Workers in smaller markets faces, uh, they face challenges in finding suitable employment, often resorting to ge ge uh, geographical relocation or settling for mismatched roles. The study underscores the significance of market size and job opportunities. Economists emphasize the concept of aglo agglomeration, where industries and professionals cluster in specific cities, amplifying career uh, prospects. Moretti's findings challenge... The notion that remote remote work heralded did an era of geogra geographic flexibility in living and working, stressing the importance, uh, stressing the enduring importance of urban hubs in career advancement. Um, the biggest takeaway is that market size matters. Moretti told Insider, "It's clear that large markets improve the quality of the match." Yeah. So basically, what this is saying is like. You know, a lot of people that were living in the city, um, they left because of COVID, right? Um, obviously, you know, they, they weren't making money. The rent was out of control. And then even after COVID, like, um, rent was out of control. And then people kind of got to this lifestyle of, like, we're work, uh, working uh, remote, right? Because of COVID. And a lot of people kind of transitioned to that. Like, the jobs that have become remote uh, have increased, you know? And what they're saying is like um, leaving a major city. So, so let's say like, and th I know people have done this. So this is actually a uh, pretty, pretty interest, uh, pretty smart. This article, but it's like, um, let's say you leave New York, and you're like, hey, what am I doing here? Right? Like, uh, I can't afford to live here. The cost of living sucks, and I could just work from home. I can work anywhere. So they take a remote job, and they go. I don't know. They live in Cleveland. Cleveland's actually pretty, but Cleveland's not that big of a market, right? So let's say they move to the middle of Ohio, right? They're able to like, with the price of what they were paying for in New York, they're able to like, you know, let's say they were renting a one bedroom in New York. Now they're in, they're in Ohio. They got a house with like four bathrooms, right? Which is totally, totally plausible. But what this, what they're saying is like, when you do that, your career is, uh, it's, it's doing career suicide, which I would agree. It's just like, Dude, like, you can say all you want about, like, uh, cost of living, right, lifestyle, like, but the city is the city for a reason. Like, all the shit's here, you know? The city, the, there's a reason why the city never sleeps. It's the greatest city in the world, right? Like, if you live in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing out there, right? Like, that's why in L.A., Hollywood's there. In New York, the, the stock market's there. Naturally, when you're in the city and there's more shit you're going to have more jobs. Like, it's just like the hub for everything, you know? So, like, that crazy dream job or the thing you've always dreamed of when you're growing up 
is only going to be in these major cities. There's a reason for that. So if you move to the middle of nowhere, yes, you're going to have a bigger apartment. You're going to pay less money, right? You're going to you can you can get a dog, you can have kids, you can do all that stuff. You can have a car, um, you can have a lawnmower, but your career could only you know go so far, right? And I get people like they want to work from home, but that's just laziness, man. You know, it's like oh, I, I, I get to work from home. How awesome is that? I never got to put pants on. But it's like. Yeah, but like, you know, if you work, like, there's still something to going to work and like seeing people and socializing and that, that kind of stuff, you know? But, you know, that's how people are. People, people are just lazy, you know? And people are entitled. They're like, why should I have to leave the house? Well, I'm blah, 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 blah. It's just like, uh, you, don't, you don't have to, but if you don't go out there, you know, well, why should I have to pay so much to live in the goddamn city? It's like, that's totally fine. But if you have no, if you have no dreams or aspirations, to, to make it, then yeah, you know, it's like a uh, big fish, small pond. You're, you're in the, in the ocean right now, right? So it's going to take a lot more work. It's going to take a lot more sacrifice, um, to make it here. You know, yeah, obviously if you go to a small town, you're going to, you know, if you're making your same salary living in New York and you're living in a small town, you're going to be killing in your small town. But what the hell are you really going to do with that money? So is it even worth it at that point? Listen, if you want to have a family, right? Start start a family, have a house. That's a different story. Like that, totally understand. But if you're just one of these people that's like, I want, I want, I want space. Um, you know, uh, 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 I don't know. I, I you, like you want space, and um, you don't want. I you just you just want to have a bigger house, maybe buy a car, buy more stuff, um, not have to deal with the hustle of the city. It's like that's fine, but it's like you know, no pain, no gain, motherfucker. You know. I know comedians that did this. I know comedians that during COVID, they were like, man, screw this city. It's going down. It's over. And like, listen, yeah, I, I even I was at the point too where it's like, I did think maybe like there was a possibility we were all going to die. The world was going to end. But I never was like one of these like, oh, I'm going to flee the city because this city is going to fall apart. Like, I, I think a lot of people that did that were probably already thinking of leaving to begin with. And now this is like the perfect excuse, you know? Because my dream was to move to New York City and do stand-up comedy, you know? So I was living my dream. So it's like, I'm happy. I wasn't going to leave the city no matter what, you know? Um, unless the pandemic was, like, longer than, I don't know, maybe. But it's like, yeah, I know these comedians that left the city. They they went to their home, back home, or they just moved somewhere where they have more space. Because, like, they were like, the city's dead. We're never going to be able to do anything ever again. It's never going to go back to once what it once was. And I always thought they were jumping the gun with that, man. But, like, yeah, they moved out. And then, like, you know, every single one I know has has either, like, moved back to the city or is freaking miserable right now. Because they legitimately went from, like, this hustle, bustle, exciting New York culture that is hard to this just, like, easygoing, not many challenges, nothing to do, like, little town, you know? And um, that's on you to decide, you know? If you want to... If you want to do that with your life, that's fine. Like, for me, I'm not in that position. Like, I, listen, like, I go on the road and I joke. Like, oh, like, what do you, like, what do you pay for your, your, your three-story house? You know, oh, my God, I pay $3,000 to live in a one-bedroom. People are like, Ugh! and I joke, like, I should move out here. I would never move out there. What the hell am I going to do with all that space, you know? There's going to be nothing to do. There's going to be, no, I'm not going to know anyone out there. Sure, I can make friends, but legit, how many people are there, you know? I start, I sleep with, pe like, I sleep with two people, you know, that know everyone else in the town, right? So I get, now I got to go to the grocery store and be careful on to run into the person I slept with last night. You know, it's just like a mess, you know? <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, uh, what am I going to do? Comedy there? There's going to be one club. I start headlining that club. What? Okay, I headline the one club in the, what the hell do I do now, you know? So in the city, it's just, there's always challenges and there's always something to do, um, and for those people that think that it's too hard or maybe they're not appreciated out here and they want to be appreciated. I mean, that's what it came. That's what I heard a lot from people. It's like the city. I, it's not working for me in the city. No one. No one's giving me stage time. No one respects me. No one that's knowing that I'm going to move and change things. And like, I mean, not, you know what, dude? It's like, you know, what's really happening. It's like you're freaking giving up. On, this is the hardest place to make it. And you're saying it's too hard for you. That's all you're doing, you know? And that's why you're miserable when you move out there because you, yeah. I mean, listen, if, you, if you're if you miserable in the city and you move to a smaller town 
You become a big, a small fish, big pond. You take over that town, and you're happy. That's totally fine for you, but that just really means your, 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 your life goals are different than someone like me that like wants to like not just make it, but wants to make it big. You know, I would not be satisfied being the best comedian in a small town. I want to be the best comedian in the biggest town. You know, I mean, you guys, you could, you guys can tell about how like not satisfied I ever am with anything. You know. So, um, yeah, I just thought that article was very interesting. And, uh, yeah, I would always suggest if you have aspirations in life, um, in any career field, um, moving out of a major market or whatever market it is you need to be in for what things like comfort and like, dude, just work like, especially when you're in your twenties, thirties, you should just be working your ass off, man. Live in the city, live in a small bedroom, you know? Uh, date around have fun and then when you get older and like you know things are a little bit more settled down with your career you kind of you know time's running out to try to you know actually make those things happen and then you know then 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 move to a small town and but if you're really like trying to forward your career and you have ambition last thing you should do is um think about comfort think about space think about uh i don't know things it should just be all focused on your career you know, when I first moved to the city, I literally moved into a place that was like 600 bucks a month because I could afford it. And I, I lived in a, a thing with no bathroom, no kitchen. I literally had to walk down the hall and like open a door and like open another door to use the bathroom. And sometimes it was a shared bathroom space. So sometimes I had to hold hold it in, you know, but I did that because I didn't care about that comfort. To me, it's like I just wanted to do stand up in New York City and I you know, I wanted to be a great comedian and I needed to be in New York to do that. So, um, yeah, if I, if I wanted to like live in a nicer spot, um, feel like I was having a good life, right? Space, all that stuff, bathroom. <laughs> I'm saying bathroom, like it's not a necessity. Like you should always want a bathroom in your living space, but it's like, if I wanted all those nice things and to live comfortably, and I moved to like a small town, then yeah, at some point I would have hated myself because I wasn't going to go anywhere in comedy. Um, all right, guys, real quickie, dicky, little icky. Um, this is interesting. Apparently, uh, an estranged couple accidentally divorced after 21 years thanks to law firm's computer error. So apparently, uh, an estranged couple was accidentally divorced when a London law firm mixed up their information with another pair's. An error, a judge says, cannot be reversed. Mr. and Mrs. Williams in court proceedings were married 21 years but separated last year and still negotiating their finances, heading towards an official split when the premature clerical error was made. Um, so this couple, they were, they were, they were I guess they were already filing for divorce or talking about it. They're figuring things out. Someone fucked up. Um... So the wrong pair's divorce application was granted within 21 minutes while the error was only discovered days later. So someone hit the wrong button on the wrong application and this couple was divorced. Um, lawyers at the firm scrambled to try to rescind the divorce order, but their application was quickly rejected by Sir Andrew McFarlane, the president of the family court division who said there was public interest in respecting the certainty and finality that flows from a divorce order and maintaining the status quo that has has established. So the lawyers realized there was a mistake made. They hit the wrong button, got the wrong couple divorced, and they tried to get it rescinded. But then uh, Sir Andrew, Mc, the, the president of the family court decision, division was like, no, because, you know, it, we got to respect if it's final, it's final. There's no going back, you know, which is kind of stupid. It's just like, dude, but it's a mistake. You know, I get it. Like things are things like finals final. Right. But like if there's a mistake, like they, it wasn't meant to be that. So the fact that you're still kind of going forward with it, not like acknowledging mistakes happen. I don't know. That's kind of dumb, you know, but honestly, it's like this couple said they were already intending to be divorced. Right. Um. So I guess like no harm, no foul in a way. The estranged wife, she said she could try to fight it, but ultimately she got what she wanted anyway. I mean, if she tried to fight it, 
then maybe she was like, I mean, it's one of those things, too. It's like, obviously, when you get divorced, like when you're going through a breakup, the decision of that magnitude, there's always going to be a little bit of a, am I doing the right thing? Right. A little bit of a uncertainty. And um, sometimes it does help to just pull the bandaid off, you know, because if you're talking about getting divorced, it's obviously a long process. And obviously through that process, you could just before it's divorce, you could just be like, hey, I changed my mind. Right. Or if you like even the opposite, if you propose someone and they say yes, you know, you're not married until you're married. Right. But once you're married, it's over. But like that whole time, there could be any decision of like, oh, screw it. Right. But. Yeah, they, she's probably just kind of jarred by it. Like, she probably was thinking, like, oh, the divorce will be fine in, like, whatever, 30 days. And then it just happens immediately. Um, even though it is what you wanted, it's just that, like, you know, the, the having the certain... Like, I remember when my ex and I broke up and I was, like, moving my stuff out of the apartment. Um, I remember, like, you know, obviously it was just, like, we had these nasty phone calls, like, get your crap out. All right, I'll get it here. I need it earlier than that. I'd be like, well, this is what I can do. Screw you, screw you, right? All this stuff, just being back and forth, just, just you know. But it wasn't when, it wasn't until when all my stuff was out, and I, I literally was like taking the last box out, when there was like a bit of sadness. It was not like she wasn't actually, like, she wasn't being mean, and I wasn't being, it, we both had kind of like a sadness, you know? Where it almost kind of felt like, do you want to talk about this again? Are we sure we want to, you know what I mean? Um, but obviously, I remember feeling that, and she was just like, I guess this is it, huh? You know, and I was just like, yeah. You know, at that point, it's 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 like, what am I going to drop the stuff and be like, you want me to move all my stuff back in? We can figure this out. It's like, no, I literally spent days moving everything out. But it was like, yeah, it's just the finale. Sometimes finality is another reminder, you know, of, uh, oh, man, we're really doing this. Are you, are you sure? You know, so. Um, yeah, but it's just stupid. Like, you know, I hope this doesn't happen where I guess to be in this system, you have to be already filing for divorce. So you're not going to accidentally divorce a couple that doesn't want to get divorced, but you never know. Maybe people work it out. And then, um, let's say this, uh, like, let's say my ex and I, for example, like we were about to, we got married and then we were like, you know, we should get divorced. We put it in the system. Maybe we actually work things out, and then we you know the next day we're like, oh, let's you know let's take back the divorce application. But they're like, oh, we hit a button by accident, and it's it's through now, you know. So it just seems silly. It is interesting though. Who knew like divorce was just a click of a button, you know? Um. All right. So guys, um, let's move on to this motivational quote before we end today. Um. It is a uh, it's a very famous day in um, not just sports history but also history in general. It is uh, Jackie Robinson Day. De today is the day that Jackie Robinson broke the the color barrier. Um, I'm a huge baseball fan, and so you know um, the impact of Jackie Robinson um, and what he did um, and what he had to go through. And like, man, it's like not only was he so important for what he did for civil rights and for sports, but he was also a damn fine player, you know? He was great, man. Um, it always feels like that. It always feels like someone that has to make a, that makes a big change in civil rights. Like, they are they are also great, too, you know? It's like, in sports, like, it, it does feel like, um, actually, you know what? That's not necessarily true. There's a lot of people that do break um, race barriers in sports, um, and they're not they're not as good as Jackie Robinson, you know, like I don't remember. I'm not exactly sure what the first black quarterback was or the first like Asian American base, basketball baseball. There's always these first. But to be the first and be so, so great is uh, crazy, man. And like um, we all know, like, you know, when Jackie Robinson was playing like the racism he dealt with, I think, um, you know, traveling to certain states to play ball. I don't think he was able to, like, stay in the same accommodations as the white players, I mean, fans would just say racist stuff at him. We all know that story. I think, was it in Boston where that happened? Where did, where did, I forget where it was exactly. Um, let me see. Where did, uh, let's Google. Where did Pee Wee Herman, is it, not Pee Wee, Pee Wee Reese, right? So, um, it was in Cincinnati. It was in Cincinnati, right? Wait, was it in Cincinnati or Boston?
Okay, so there seems to be a lot of conflicting stories, but we, we've all heard that story where uh, Pee Wee Reese, um, so Jackie's just getting it from these racist fans, boos, racist shouts, and they're just like, they hate him. And then uh, Pee Wee Reese goes over and puts his uh, arm around Jackie to kind of comfort him, you know, show some solidarity. Um, is it, now I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of stuff that didn't happen. It did happen. Um, did it really happen? I guy this so now you know this beautiful thing I'm trying to tell you may not have happened. Um, Cincinnati fan. Okay, it was in Cincinnati. Cincinnati fans were giving Robinson a particularly tough time as the Dodgers took the field, the bottom of the first, and to show support, Reese tem- temporarily left his position at shortstop, traveled to Robinson at first base, put his arm around the rookie, silencing the crowd, which was awed by the act of racial empathy by Reese, a popular all-star from nearby Kentucky. Um, yeah. So happy Jackie Robinson day. And today for today's motivational quote, I wanted to share with you a Jackie Robinson quote, a life is not important except in the impact it has on others lives. Um, I don't think that's the quote. (laughs) <laughs> it's that's just the that's the genesis of it i i just think uh i don't think i i don't think that's exactly how it's worded um let me let's let's do that again uh a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives okay jackie robinson um yeah you know if you think anyone like listen most people um uh, normal people they live their lives and um they they die right no one cares um you forget them it's a sad reality, right? Um, but if you think about it, the more impact you have on other people, the more you are important and the more you're remembered, right? And it doesn't have to be so big. Like obviously, like if if you do something like what Jackie Robinson did, where you impact so many people's lives, like you open the color barrier, um, all this stuff, you're gonna be remembered forever, right? Because think of the amount of people he's impacted, right? Even negatively, if you like impact people negatively, you will be remembered. Like think about the, the the Ted Bundys and stuff, right? They've impacted people's lives so negatively. So many people all throughout the world are horrified. It's like so, you know. He's and it's not. Listen, it's not important his life, but it's just an example of like the more you have, people's lives you affect, the more you get remembered, right? And it could even be in, in your family, right? You don't even have to be famous, but like let's say, um. You know, you uh, you bring your uh, you know, um, you come to this country from a, from a third world country, and then like you know you come here, you, you got two dollars in your pocket, right? I mean, this is a lot of people's gen- uh, ancestors come to this country with two dollars, right? As an immigrant, you make something of yourselves. You have a family, right? And your family's successful, yada yada yada. It's like your parents are always going to talk about your grandpa or whatever that uncle was or whoever for generations and generations, right? Because you, in fact, impacted so many people's lives. So, um, the less and the less people's lives you impact, you know, the more people forget about you. Because think about it: it's like if you don't really do anything for anyone, they're not gonna tell other people about you. They're not gonna talk about you. You know. Um, so yeah, that's like it's hard. It's 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 weird to put importance and uh, numbers and figures and stuff and emph- like on people's lives because obviously every life is important technically even though that's kind of a it's kind of just bullshit you know it's kind of a nice thing people say but it's very important like i think a good life a fulfilled life is a life where you do try to help people you know you do um try to make an impact on others you know i'm not saying i want to be like you know as important as jackie Rob. i never will be but i do think a part of my life that's very uh valuable to me and gives me importance is that yeah i can make people laugh you know i i I, you know when people have a night out maybe they're down or maybe when i post my stuff even though i complain that um, no one watches my stand-up stuff when i post the stuff that does do well like the self front facing videos like people genuinely enjoy it i give them a little bit of reprieve uh from their day from their whatever right just give them a laugh um i also try my life to be a good role model you know if someone needs help like the people that are close to me i really try to like I try to help in any way I can. If there's like other comedians, I can help by giving them some of the knowledge I've learned. If there's just friends or anyone that is going through something that I've been through, I feel like I can help them. 
I always try to. I don't do it. I don't do it so I could feel important or feel like people remember me. I just think it's the right thing to do, you know. And that's really a judgment of someone. It's like a judgment of someone of who you are is how you affect other people's lives. Like anyone that's like really desirable, like unlike even like like what what, what do women like? Like handsome guys, chiseled guys, confident guys, but they also like guys that have a lot of friends and have a lot of status, you know? Um Same thing with uh same thing with uh guys. I mean, not as much. Guys are a little bit more shallow. Like looks are just kind of really all guys care about, but as uh but yeah, you know, the more people, more friends you have, the more attractive that is for sure, you know? So, um, I don't know. I think if you uh, if you feel like you're not fulfilled in your life, if you feel like your life is not uh, going the way you want, it's just like, also think about like how are you affecting other people's lives, you know? Even if it's something is like you're taking care of a child, that's huge, man. I mean, all the stuff I do, making people laugh, all that, like, it could be th- it might be millions of people at this point. I mean, it doesn't equate to having an impact on a child's life, you know? So uh yeah, I don't know. I feel like if let's say I don't know how you guys are doing, but if you feel like if you feel down, if you feel like you're not important, just think about are you, you know, what are you doing for other people, you know? Um that's one thing I've learned as I grow up. It's like I'm not necessarily happy when I'm selfish like listen like I need to be selfish I I I like working for myself focusing on my career but I also I get a lot out of giving back and um, helping other people Um, that's very important to me Um, as uh, you know it's just important to give back you know pass the knowledge on from generation to generation so guys that is this week's uh, podcast I will be home this weekend, so I, there will most likely be an episode on uh, Saturday. And um, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate your viewership. Um, please, again, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Go to my uh, social medias. Watch the stand-up clips. Like the stand-up clips. And uh, I will see you next time. Adios.